All right, everyone. Um, welcome to the ACOM seminar this week. It's my pleasure to introduce Amy Butler from the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory here in Boulder. Um, Amy's definitely one of the public faces of sudden stratospheric warmings and earth system predictability research. Um, Amy started her career as a graduate student with Dave Thompson up the road at Colorado State University. Um, then she took a position at NOAA CPC in Maryland before finally finding her way back to Colorado, um, where she took a position at the uh, Chemical Sciences Laboratory through Ceres, and just recently um, became a federal scientist with NOAA. Um, like I said, Amy's done a lot of really amazing work, both research and in terms of public outreach on Earth system predictability and sudden stratospheric warmings. Um, but today she's going to talk about something that's maybe not as often discussed, which is final stratospheric warmings. So Amy, take it away. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to share my screen real fast. All right, can you hopefully see that? Um, I wanna thank ACOM for inviting me to speak today. I'm gonna to be talking about characteristics of final stratospheric warmings and implications for springtime predictability. And one of the characteristics I'll be talking about is the structure of the vortex as it transitions from its wintertime state to its summertime state. And so what we're looking at here is for one year in 2009, the 50 millibar geopotential heights and contours and their anomalies in shading. And so you can see this nice wave number three structure, which is one of the unusual features we find about final stratospheric warmings that I'll be talking about. So I'm sorry, click. Amy, we're still having that. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Um, quick overview. Um, first, I want to talk about what is the final stratospheric warming and how do we define it? And then I'll be talking about two key characteristics of these events, their timing and their wave structure. And then I'll move on to talk about the impact of these characteristics on total column ozone and tropospheric circulation for both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And then for just the Northern Hemisphere, we also looked at how the final warming enhances predictability of springtime near surface temperatures. And I'm gonna be covering two papers in this talk today. So in case you're interested in reading any more about it, you can refer to these here. The first is a paper that was just accepted to Weather and Climate Dynamics, and my co-author was Daniela Domeisen from ETH Zurich, and it's on the wave geometry of final stratospheric warming events. And the second paper is a little bit older. It's from 2019, and it's on the predictability of Northern Hemisphere final stratospheric warmings and their surface impacts. All right, so to understand what the final stratospheric warming is, we have to understand a little bit about the seasonal cycle of the stratospheric polar vortex. And so these plots show time series of the zonal mean, zonal winds, and on the left, it's at 60 degrees north, and on the right, it's at 60 degrees south, and both at 10 hectopascals. And these are just the daily uh, zonal mean, zonal winds for every day in the G GRA 55 reanalysis from 1958 to 2019. And we've just averaged them for every day of the calendar year. And so it's showing us the seasonal cycle over the course of that record, the climatological record. And so the yellow line in each plot shows the daily mean value over the record. And then the thin black lines show the maximum and minimum values and the shading shows um, some percentile of those values. I think it's um, the 10th and the 30th percentiles. And what we can see is that in the Northern hemisphere, uh, the polar vortex is this region of westerly winds. So we can see it becomes westerly starting in late August. The winds peak in late December, early January, and then the winds decay again back towards easterly between March and May. And during summertime, the vortex is gone. There's just weak easterlies in the stratosphere. Um, in the Southern hemisphere, we see the same thing, but of course uh, with a seasonal shift. So in this case, the vortex forms in mid-February, the winds peak in mid-August, and then they decay between November and December. So there's some other key features we can get out of these plots. The first is that uh, obviously there's a lot of extremes in these time series marked by the thin black lines. Um, in the Northern hemisphere, the variability is largest in midwinter. 
And you can see that sometimes in the middle of winter, the winds actually reverse direction. And this is called the major sudden stratospheric warming. It happens about six times per decade, although some decades have much more and some have far fewer. And um, you can see that this happens a lot more often in the Northern hemisphere than in the Southern hemisphere, where we just have this one little peak that's gone below zero meters per second, um, showing a reversal of the winds. And that is a major sudden warming that happened in 2002. There was also a near reversal of the winds in 2019 in September. You can sort of see the outline of that event in the black line. Um, in the Southern hemisphere, the other thing to note is that the maximum winds get much stronger than in the Northern hemisphere, about double um, in the middle of winter. And the variability is much lo lower. And this is tied to the wave forcing from the troposphere that's in each hemisphere that drives some of the variations in the stratosphere. And so in the Southern hemisphere, there's a lot less land sea contrast. And so we get um, the vortex just stays strong. It's not perturbed by these waves. And so you don't get as many sudden stratospheric warmings. And when you do, they tend to happen as the vortex is decaying um, into spring. And so then we come to the feature that I'll be focused on today, which is the final stratospheric warming. It's the seasonal transition of the vortex to the summertime easterlies. And in the Northern hemisphere, there's a wide period where this event can happen anywhere from early March to mid-May uh, with a standard deviation of 18 days. And in the Southern hemisphere, this event tends to be less variable. It only varies by about a month and the standard deviation is 12 days. So what drives this transition? Well, um, clearly because it's a seasonal cycle, it's related to the the solar insulation um, that's coming in. And so this plot on the left shows the daily mean solar insulation as a function of latitude and month. And this is from Hartman 2016. And on the right, I've plotted the same sort of plot, a latitude by month version of the daily mean zonal mean zonal winds at 10 hectopascals. Um, and so you can see these plots are fairly similar. And so what we're seeing here is that uh, the daily solar insulation, of course, peaks at the high latitudes in summertime. And then starting at the um, fall equinox, the sunlight at the pole disappears. And so we enter a period known as polar night. And so the polar night peaks at a latitude of 66 degrees north at um, the winter solstice of each hemisphere. And during that period, you can see that um, there's a much stronger gradient from equator to pole in the solar insulation that's coming in. Now, the stratosphere is the home of the ozone layer and the ozone absorbs UV radiation and warms the stratosphere. So when there's no solar radiation, it gets very cold. Um, this creates a temperature gradient. This is what's driving the formation of the polar vortex. And then when we get to, to spring in each hemisphere, you can see that the sunlight returns on the spring equinox and um, at 90 degrees north and then, and then continues to return um, to peak into the summertime. And so you're basically flattening out these gradients from 60 to 90 north and same with in the Southern hemisphere. And so that's what's relaxing those winds back to easterlies during the summertime. And so if we were just going to do a rough guesstimate of the seasonal transition based solely on the solar insulation gradient, um, I would estimate it's about um, these, these gradients relax probably 30 to 40 days after the equinox. And in the um, fall, I would say about 30 days before the equinox is when we start to see a, a strong gradient pick up. And so that's sort of where just by radiation alone, you might expect um, the final warming to occur. But instead what we see is in the Northern hemisphere, the time between the, the spring equinox and the final warming date on average is 22 days. And in the Southern hemisphere, it's 57 days. So in the Northern hemisphere, it's quite a bit shorter than what we might expect from just the solar insulation. And in the Southern Hemisphere, it's much longer than that. So there's clearly other processes going on that's causing these differences in timing in the seasonal transition in spring. So um, before we get into the details, I wanna talk about how we determine the date to the final warming because it ends up being somewhat important. Um, there's really no consistent metric for determining the final warming, but there are a number of very uh, definitions in the literature and I've listed some here, I won't go into detail on them. Um, they vary in complexity. They use different um, latitudes to determine the final warming date and um, different met even different levels in some cases. The Hardeman et al. 2011 paper, which is very well cited, uses the reversal at either 10 hectopascals or 1 hectopascal first. 
Um, so I wanted to give some thoughts on how we chose the metrics for the final warming date in, in our studies. Um, one thing that we thought would be important would be a consistency with the common midwinter sudden stratospheric warming definition, which is the one defined by Charlton and Polvani in 2007. It's just the reversal of the 10 hectopascal 60 degree north winds below zero meters per second in winter time. And the reason why this might be important is because if you just have one time series, sort of like I showed at the beginning of the talk, um, you can use this to determine everything about the seasonal cycle of the vortex and you don't have to worry about events that might be classified as a final warming using one definition, but a sudden warming in another definition. And so this just el uh, eliminates all that complexity and just makes it a little more straightforward. The second thing is that we wanted it to capture dynamic variability well. And in a study I did with Ed Gerber in 2018, we found that at least for midwinter sudden stratospheric warmings, um, 10 hectopascals and 60 degrees north uh, was really optimal it, to find these dynamic events that had the strongest deceleration and also um, the strongest wave driving, um, driving the events ahead of time. Um, and so we like that that definition optimizes those features. And we think it might be important for the final warming as well. Uh, we also think, we also found, as I'm going to show, that the it's important to be able to calculate uh, or capture ozone circulation feedbacks, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, 10 hectopascals turns out to be quite high for that. Uh, it's above the ozone layer. And so if we choose a layer like 50 hectopascals, you really um, start to see some of those feedbacks, as I will demonstrate. And then finally, just a more practical matter, but uh, we did use some of the S2S prediction project data, which is uh, a set of hindcast data from operational forecast centers. And we wanted it to be applicable to most model output. And those, they're often you only have winds provided at 10, 50, and 100, if that. So um, being able to do like a one hectopascal definition wouldn't really be practical for that case. All right, so this is what we ended up using. Um, we used two different definitions because we wanted to test the robustness of the definition to our analysis. And so the first one is that we picked out the first date that the daily zonal mean zonal winds at 10 hectopascals and 60 degrees north reversed easterly and don't return to westerly for more than 10 consecutive, consecutive days through June 30th in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, this means that if you have, uh, if your winds turn to easterly in spring, but then it goes back up for two days and then it comes down, um, it would just be the first date of the reversal because those two days don't count. Um, but if it was like 12 days, then you'd wait for the second time that it reverses um, and then doesn't go back up again. So you get this time series of final warming dates as a function of year for the JRA 55 reanalysis going back to 1958 through 2019. The median date, if you do this, is April 12th. And this is, we looked at, um, we compared this with error interim and it, we got very similar results as well. Okay, but we wanted to compare with one other definition just to be sure. And what we decided on was the same definition, except we're gonna use 50 hectopascals. And um, the thing about 50 hectopascals is that often the winds in the summer don't reverse all the way to easterly at that level. And so similar to the Black et al. studies in 2006 and 2007, we picked a five meter per second threshold. So if you do this, you get the time series in blue and we can see that just by eye, it looks very similar. The median date is very slightly later at April 15th. And these time series are interannually correlated at 0.68. So they're quite well correlated. You can see some years where the dates are quite different. So for example, in 1984, um, if you use the 50 hectopascal date, it, it occurs much earlier than if you use the 10 hectopascal date. So that has some implications for our results later on when we're going to composite um, early final warmings, those that happen before the climatological median, and late events, those that happen after the climatological median. So you get slightly different dates depending on your definition here. So in the southern hemisphere, we do the same thing. We just use 60 degrees south instead. So this is for um, the 10 hectopascal definition. And we're only using um, in this study back to 1979, just because the reanalysis has been found to be somewhat unreliable in the stratosphere um, due to lack of observations prior to 1979. Um, so the median date in the Southern Hemisphere at 10 hectopascals is November 17th. When we use the 50 hectopascal definition, and here in the Southern Hemisphere, because the winds stay stronger for a lot longer, 
we're now using a 10 meter per second threshold. What we find is something that looks quite a bit different than our definition at 10 hectopascals. And so in this case, our median date is almost three weeks later than the one at 10 hectopascals. It occurs on December 6th. Um, if we're just looking at interannual variations, they're still highly correlated at 0.76. So if you're just interested in the ups and downs, early versus late, you would still um, see generally the same pattern no matter which level you used. But the, probably the most interesting thing is that clearly the 50 hectopascal time series has this sort of um, trend that switches around the year 2000. And so if you look from 1979 to 2000, there is a trend towards much later final warmings at a rate of 0.7 days per year. And as other studies, including this Waddle 1999 study have found, this has been linked to ozone depletion that has occurred during that time period. And um, so the dates have gotten later over time and in, in correspondence with more ozone depletion during that period. On the other hand, from 2001 to 2019, we see a trend in the opposite direction towards earlier final warming dates in the Southern hemisphere of about 0.9 days per year. And some recent study by uh, Tara Banerjee has shown that in the troposphere, the circulation trends have stopped, um, sort of paused because of the Montreal protocol actions that have started the ozone hole recovery. And so we think that this is a clear sign that in the stratosphere, there's also this change in direction of um, reflecting this ozone recovery in the final warming dates. So that's definitely an important feature in the Southern hemisphere. And it does really matter what you define your date as in that case. So the timing of the final warmings, um, early versus late, is a fundamental characteristic of final warmings, and it does have impacts on the surface as well. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, the timing has been found to be primarily linked to the occurrence of midwinter sudden stratospheric warmings, because um, when you have a sudden warming, what tends to happen is that the vortex will want to recover because it's still in polar night during midwinter. And so you'll get this vortex recovery, and that kind of, for a a time period it turns off some of the interaction with the waves. And so it tends to make the, the final warming happen later. In fact, the median date of final warmings in years without a sudden warming is April 1st, whereas in years with a sudden warming is April 24th. So it's, it's a pretty big difference using the 10 hectopascal dates. Um, so there's some dynamical difference between um, the timing that's occurring in, in the Northern hemisphere. In the Southern hemisphere, the timing is linked um, primarily to polar cap ozone in early spring. So these chemical climate feedbacks. And so this is a scatter plot that shows the final warming date of year on the Y axis uh, with the austral spring total column ozone over the polar cap on the X axis. And here austral spring is the time of peak ozone depletion from September 7th to October 13th. And this data is from the Boudicca scientific uh, total column ozone database. And so this is showing the final warming dates at both 10 hectopascals and 50 hectopascals. Um, both of them are correlated with the total column ozone earlier in spring uh, at a correlation of 0.53, which is statistically significant. And so what this says is that when we have ozone loss or low ozone in austral spring, we tend to have a much later final warming date. Um, and so what happens is as you lose ozone, that cools the vortex, it makes the wind stronger and more persistent later into the season. And um, it's kind of interesting that it also happens at um, 10 hectopascals. You see that same sort of relationship occurring. Um, all right, so the other thing is that this does seem to, especially in the Northern hemisphere, have a, the timing does seem to suggest some different dynamics that are going on. And so this plot just shows the zonal winds at um, 10 hectopascals and 50 hectopascals on the right um, for both the Northern hemisphere at the top row and the Southern hemisphere in the bottom row. And here we're just breaking the time series into early in black and late in pink. And this is for all the final warmings that meet for each year that are either early versus late as a function of the date of the final warming. And so this is sort of built in because we're defining the final warming um, based on when you get that reversal of the winds or when it falls below the threshold at 50 hectopascals. Um, and so obviously early final warmers, 
final warmings are earlier in the seasonal cycle. So they're going to start out with a stronger wind. Um, but what I think is clear is that um, the early final warming show a much stronger deceleration in both hemispheres compared to late final warmings. And I think it's especially clear at 10 hectopascals in the northern hemisphere, there's just a very sudden deceleration for the early events, whereas the late events just kind of gradually transition to easterlies. And this would suggest a more dynamic event for an earlier case. And in the Northern Hemisphere, we, we looked at this in the Butler et al. 2019 study. We looked at vertical wave propagation just before these events, um, the 20 days before and the 30 days after. And so we're showing the 45 to 75 north 100 hectopascal eddy heat flux anomaly here uh, for early on the left and late events on the right. And so um, the green, green X's show where these where the differences are statistically significant. And so we see this buildup of uh, wave activity just prior to and when the early final warming occurs, whereas you don't see anything like that for the late events. So it suggests that, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, the early final warmings tend to be more sudden and dynamically driven. In other words, they're basically like midwinter sun stratospheric warmings, except the only difference is they don't recover to westerlies after the fact. So the timing actually ends up having a uh, impact on the predictability of the final warmings. And this is a plot from Butler et al. 2019 in which we're looking at the S2S uh, hindcasts. And these are from different models shown in the colors. Um, the multi-model mean is shown in black. And what we're looking at here is the percent of ensemble members that detect the final warming date within plus or minus three days up to 20 days, um, sorry, at, at lead times um, in these five day bins. So we have uh, up to 30 days ahead of time. The black crossed bars here show the false alarm rate or the final warmings that were forecast but did not actually occur to give us an idea of how often the model just happens to predict a final warming that's um, not actually occurring. So we can see that 45% uh, of all members detect the final warming accurately up to 20 days in advance. That's this little black point here. You can see some models are doing better than other models at that. Um, but in general, you can see that um, the percent of models detecting the final warming for some models even extends back as far as 30 days. And this is much more skillful prediction at longer leads compared to other stratospheric extremes, which we compared in Demise and et al. 2020. However, when we broke this into early versus late events, um, so this black line is the same one that was shown in this previous plot, but now we're looking at um, early events shown in the dashed lines and late events shown in the dashed dot lines. And so you can clearly see that the early final warmings are much less predictable at longer lead times than these late final warmings. In fact, you don't really get much predictability at all until 10 days before, which is very comparable to the predictability of midwinter warmings. So again, because there are more dynamic events that are dependent on these sort of um, short-term variations in wave activity right before the event happens. Um, they're less predictable than the final warmings, which might be more radiatively driven. At the end of the season, the model knows that, you know, it's following the seasonal cycle at that point. It knows the final warming is going to happen. So the predictability is a lot higher. All right, so moving on a little bit from the timing, I wanted to talk about um, another characteristic of final warmings, which is the vortex wave geometry. And this is highlighted in this recent paper that was accepted. So I refer to that a lot if you want to go back and see any of these figures. So mid-winter sun stratospheric warmings are often characterized by either a wave number one or two structure. Um, and this is sort of like thinking of a split versus a displacement, although they're not always um, comparable to the wave number one or wave number two structure. Um, but we wanted to know, can final warmings be classified in the same way? And so this is a plot showing two sudden stratospheric warmings, one in 2018, which had this really nice wave two structure. And by wave two, I just mean um, there's two troughs and um, two ridges essentially in the stratosphere. And the same thing happened in 2019, although this was a bit of a mixed case because the vortex first shifted off the pole. And so there was a wave one structure leading into the event and then the vortex split into two. And so um, we had more of a wave two structure in that case. So that was more of a combination wave one, wave two. Um, but we hadn't seen anybody look at this in final warming. So we wanted to see uh, what would happen if we did that. 
So to do this, we debated different ways to classify the vortex wave geometry, um, including looking at elliptical vortex moments uh, using the PV gradient. But the problem is, as you're moving into the seasonal transition, the PV gradients are rapidly weakening. And so we found that probably the best method to use was a Fourier decomposition in the zonal direction of the 50 hectopascal daily mean geopotential heights average over 55 to 65 north or south for the 10 days prior to the final warming. And this is the same me method used in Barrio Pedro and Calvo 2014. They did this for sudden warmings to determine sort of the wave forcing of the event just prior to it. So note that this is day zero through 10 before the event, so it won't capture anything that happens afterwards. Um, just wanna make sure that's clear. Um, the classification was then determined by two criteria, either the wave number, we looked at both the wave number that had um, the maximum amplitude for the greatest number of days, and also the maximum amplitude averaged over the 10 day period. And so as an example, um, you can see this is a chart that we had in our paper showing the events listed. So for 1979, the wave number with the greatest mean amplitude over that entire 10 day period was wave two. Um, but then when we looked at the wave number percent of days, which wave number had the maximum amplitude, um, in this case, it was clearly a wave two event. So the final classification was a wave two. They're not always that um, straightforward. Sometimes it's more of a mixed event. And uh, fortunately, we found that uh, only twice in the record did they completely disagree. And those were unclassified events. Um, in each hemisphere, there were two cases. So that's how we ended up classifying these types of events. And I wanna show you some examples of what these look like for final warmings. And so uh, this just shows some wave one structures on the top row and wave two structures on the bottom row. And the left two columns are the Northern hemisphere, the right two are the Southern hemisphere. And we're looking at both the 10 hectopascal and the 50 hectopascal dates, just to make sure the structures are similar at each level, no matter how you define the date. Um, and what we see is that in general, the wave structures and geopotential heights just prior to final warmings are strongly reminiscent of structures observed during wave one and wave two sudden warmings. Um, so for wave one, you get this sort of shift off the pole, often in the Northern hemisphere towards Eurasia and um, in the Southern hemisphere towards South America. And then in for wave two structures, we really see these nice, um, even sometimes split events in the northern hemisphere, or at least elongated over the pole. Um, so they're kind of stretched out often. And this is particularly true in the southern hemisphere. We don't often see um, a full split of the vortex, but we often see it elongating over the polar cap. And you get this sort of wave two structure, which is especially apparent in the anomalies or the shading. Um, the interesting thing we found about final warmings is that there is really a significant role of wave number three. Um, a lot of the events were still classified in the end as wave one or wave two. We did have one event that was fully classified as wave three, and that's the event I showed on the first slide in 2009. But there were a number of other cases where um, you see this really nice wave three structure, even in the Southern hemisphere. And we did check and we found that um, the wave three ratio compared to wave one was a lot higher prior to final warmings as compared to sudden warmings. And we think this is just because the waves are weakening in the springtime. And so you're actually allowing higher wave numbers to propagate a little bit higher. And so you get some more interesting structures than you might get in the middle of winter. I wanted to point out that the final warming this year had a wave three structure. Um, I want to thank Zach Lawrence for this plot from his terrific website stratobserve.com, which you can go look at. Um, and this just shows the 50 hectopascal heights and temperatures um, on the day of the final warming, April 25th this year. And credit to Scott Osprey, who made a great comment saying this looks like the world's largest fidget spinner, which I think uh, it definitely does. So uh, I think that's a great image for capturing this structure. All right, so now I'm going to get into sort of the impacts on total column ozone and tropospheric circulation. And I'm going to focus first on the northern hemisphere, and then we'll talk about the southern hemisphere separately. So we wanted to first look at the robustness of the vortex geometry um, for different characteristics. 
So are we seeing uh, similar shifts in the vortex for wave one and wave two? And how does this look if you then look at the structure for early events versus late events? And so these are just composites of the dates that meet different criteria. So on the left, we have wave one and wave two, again, looking at dates defined at both 10 hectopascals and 50 hectopascals to make sure that doesn't make much of a difference. And then same thing on the right, except now we're comparing early versus late events. And so what we see is that um, generally the wave one structures are very robust. Uh, we see the shift of the vortex towards Eurasia and this buildup in a, of a stratospheric elution high over North America. And the wave two um, is slightly less robust in terms of where exactly the vortex is elongating to. There's no stipling as you can see, but um, you do get the same sort of robust position of the um, high pressure over um, the Aleutian Islands and over Europe here. And so that seems robust among those events. Um, if we compare this to early versus late, most of the early events also have a wave one structure to them, which is kind of interesting. Um, it seems less robust if we use the 50 hectopascal dates. Uh, and we'll see that a little bit. Um, you can see that in some of the ozone results as well. Um, for the late event, it's kind of by definition that it occurs this way, but by definition, late events happen uh, when the vortex is still around later in the season. And so we see anomalously strong conditions over the polar cap, which is by these negative height anomalies. Um, so that's what that looks like. There's not a lot of wave structure to it when we look at the late events. So then we can try to do the same exact thing, but we look at total column ozone instead. And so this is now just looking at the 1979 to 2016 period when we have the ozone data set. And we're showing the anomalies in total column ozone 10 days prior to final, the final warming date. And here we're using the 10 hectopascal dates um, because there seemed to be a clearer wave structure for those events. But in the paper, we have it also at 50 hectopascals, so you can compare. They generally look similar. And so what we see is that for all events, you can you kind of get this wave one structure out. That's because there's more wave one events than wave two events. Um, but if we then compare the wave one versus wave two events, you can see that it's quite different between wave one and wave two, particularly over um, Asia and Europe, where we're getting the uh, statistically significant differences shown by the stipling here. Um, so in the wave one events, you're definitely having a bigger impact on this um, lower ozone, total column ozone amounts over Eurasia and higher amounts over North America and the Pacific. The same sort of structure comes out in early events. Um, and so, you know, if you were forecasting these and you knew you were gonna have an early event, uh, it's much more likely that your ozone would look like this compared to uh, a final warming that happened later in the year where you really get much weaker anomalies. There's not as much difference um, happening across the globe. Um, it's more mixed and less significant. And so um, this shows some of the interesting differences we can get out of either knowing the wave geometry or the timing of the event. And similarly, this has in influence on surface climate and tropospheric circulation. So now we're showing the same sorts of plots, but for the 50 hectopascal geopotential height anomalies. Um, and this is for now the full record 1958 to 2019. So the event numbers are a little different than in the ozone case. Um, and we're averaging this, the 500 hectopascal height seven to 30 days after the final warming event. We use the 50 hectopascal dates to look at surface climate because it's been shown that lower in the stratosphere has a stronger link on surface climate. And what we see is that no matter how you define what kind of classification the event is, it, for the most part, you get the same sort of response over the European and North Atlantic sector. So all events show a negative NAO-like change over the North Atlantic after the event. Um, and that is pretty consistent no matter what type of event it is. But one thing we thought was quite interesting is that if you compare wave one and wave two over North America, you actually see quite different structures over North America that are significantly different. And to some extent, that's true for the early case and late case as well. You see this flip of the sign of the circulation over that region. And we think um, that this may not necessarily be related to um, 
you know, the type of event that this is, although it could be because the vortex is moving in different ways. I haven't, we haven't quite figured out how that would connect, but um, another possibility is that it's just linked to the driver of the stratospheric geometry in the first case. So um, for example, uh, if you have a La Nina event, you might be more likely to have a wave two structure going into the stratosphere. Um, and so that might correspond better to this pattern that then persists um, after the final warming event. So there's some interesting features that show up here, um, but over Europe, we see the same structure no matter what. And so I wanted to show how this could be linked to predictability of two meter temperature. This is from the um, Butler et al 2019 study. And so in this case, um, we're now using some air interim data uh, because we were focused on the period of the S2S forecast models, which went, went anywhere from 1981 to 2016, although different models had different forecast lengths. And so this just shows on the left the air interim composites of the two meter temperatures anomalies averaged weeks three, four after the final warming. So we were particularly interested in um, the longevity of these anomalies after the event and whether they could be used to enhance predictability in springtime. And so what we see it for all final warmings, um, if we do that composite, is that there's not that much going on, but there is sort of this structure over Europe and Asia where you get these cold anomalies, um, over Europe and then these really warm anomalies over East Asia. And um, if you then break this into early and late final warmings, uh, what really jumps out is that their um, early final warmings show a lot colder anomalies everywhere and late final warming final warmings show a lot warmer um, anomalies everywhere. Um, now in general, they both have these cold anomalies kind of um, east of Scandinavia uh, and warm anomalies over parts of a Eastern Asia. Um, but otherwise they're pretty different. And in particular over North America, the sign of the anomalies again are flipped. Um, and so there seems to be this real difference in something going on between the early final warmings and the late final warmings. We did check, we don't think this is a result of a trend or sampling of a trend um, because some of the models had different um, periods of record that covered the 1981 to 2016 period, and they still showed very similar anomaly maps. Um, we think that, again, these might be a reflection of ENSO. Um, most of the early final warmings during this period were followed by, uh, followed El Nino years, and most of the late final warmings followed La Nina years. Um, and so this might be what's essentially going on. And when we look at the S2S forecast, so this is now the model data, um, we can see in this case, uh, it's a lot cleaner in some ways because we have many more ensemble members. So a lot of the noise is averaged out when we're doing this. So now we're looking at, uh, we pick out the initialization date that's closest to the final warming date and then average three to four weeks after that um, from the final warming date to get this plot on the left. And so again, we get this sort of structure out over uh, Eurasia, this opposing structure of negative anomalies and positive anomalies. And uh, when you then do this separately for early versus late final warmings, what we see are these um, kind of opposing differences over North America um, that match with what we were seeing in terms of the phase of ENSO that corresponds to each one. Um, and so what's kind of interesting about this is that in some ways, when you average all the final warmings together, um, you're kind of canceling out the ENSO component because the early final warmings are this phase of ENSO El Nino and the late final warmings are the La Nina effects. And so in some ways you're canceling that out and you're left with at these three to four week timescales, the influence of the stratosphere. And that tends to be this pattern over primarily Eurasia. Um, so, we then looked at how this influences our, our skill scores of the um, final warming forecasts compared to control forecasts. So to do this, we, we basically use the same dates as the final warmings, but randomized the years. And we made sure to pick out years where the final warming hadn't already happened. Um, so just random years, and that was our control. 
Um, and then we compared that to our final warming forecasts and we calculated the anomaly correlation coefficient, which is what's shown in these plots. So in general, you can see that there's positive increases in skill across the Northern Hemisphere, extratropics and Eurasia for the final warming hindcast relative to the control hindcast. Um, but it does vary a bit spatially. And um, we looked over certain regions shown in the blue boxes and we averaged uh, with by weighting by latitude uh, across those areas. And we found significant increases primarily for early final warmings where you see a, um, anomaly correlation increase uh, across the Northern hemisphere as a whole of 0.17 and across Europe at, by a matter of 0.24 increase in skill, which is quite a lot actually, when you're looking at these weeks three, four, you're really wanting whatever skill you can get. And especially in springtime, we think that this is a potentially important way to get some skill in the in the spring season. You see less skill increase in late final warmings, and um, we're not sure why that is, but it's possible. It's just you, it's a less dynamical event, so there's less of a change um, in the surface, or at least less of a predictable change in the surface. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that this is for the multi-model mean, and so. Certain models, especially ones with a good stratosphere like ECMWF, showed a lot higher increases in skill than this, including over Europe, um, ECMWF was seeing increases of 0.41 anomaly correlation following early final warmings. All right, so that's some of the implications of these results is that the timing of these events could actually have an influence on your surface predictability. All right, so we did not do the same type of thing in the Southern Hemisphere, but we did look at um, total column ozone and influence on the tropospheric circulation. Um, and we wanted to particularly understand the role of vortex geometry on this. Uh, the early versus late has to some extent been studied in previous literature, um, but I'm gonna show the results here because I think it tells an interesting story. Um, so again, this is just the uh, 50 hectopascal heights and anomalies uh, average for different classifications. So wave one and wave two on the left and early versus late on the right. And so what you can see is that the wave one, there's a really obvious wave one structure that's pretty robust using the 10 hectopascal dates. It's present, but not robust at 50, using the 50 hectopascal dates. Um, and this wave structure is not that apparent in, for example, the early events where the main feature is just a weaker on average vortex, which again is sort of by definition. And again, the late events are showing a much stronger vortex um, prior to the final warming. Um, the wave two events, I should mention, there's very few samples in this case, there are only four events, I think in the Southern hemisphere that were classified as wave two. So it's hard to know if this is a very robust feature, um, but you can see you don't get, like in the Northern Hemisphere, it was very clear. You could still see that wave two structure even in the composite. And you don't really see that once you average over the four events. So it suggests that there's quite a bit of noise to those cases. This does seem to have an influence on total column ozone. Um, in particular, uh, the wave one events really show, I mean, when you classify by wave one, you really get the wave one pattern out. Um, which uh, is not that apparent if you were just looking at timing. So early versus late, um, there's strong differences, but there's not really a wave structure to it. Um, it's just there's more anomalously more ozone during early events and less ozone during late events, just prior to the event. Um, the wave two is, is pretty noisy again, so it's really hard to tell with that one. And this has links to surface climate as well. Um, although we found that the wave geometry had very little difference on the surface climate. So for day seven to 30 after the event, after all events, you generally see a weak negative SAM when they're averaged together. Um, nothing is really significant. Um, and that same pattern emerges for both wave one and wave two, although wave two is pretty noisy. But when you then compare early versus late is when you see this completely opposite difference in the surface um, or the tropospheric climate afterwards. Um, basically, you see opposing influences. So when you average them all together, you wouldn't get this that the full picture here because the early events show a much more negative SAM uh, or Southern annular mode compared to late events. Um, 
And this finding agrees with the recent trend towards earlier final warmings, and that's a more negative um, SAM or poleward shifted or equatorward shifted jet. And that's consistent with this pause in the poleward shift of the Southern Hemisphere jet stream that was recently shown. All right, so I'm gonna get to my takeaway messages. Um, the final warming in the Northern Hemisphere is modulated primarily by dynamics, whereas in the Southern Hemisphere, it's um, more modulated by feedbacks with ozone. And we would argue that defining the final warming at 10 hectopascal may better capture dynamic variability to some extent, um, but defining it at 50 hectopascals may better capture the variability and in particular the trends associated with chemistry climate feedbacks, which may be especially important in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the Northern Hemisphere final stratospheric warmings that occur in early spring are less predictable than those that occur in late spring. And we think that that's because the dynamics driving those events are very similar to what happens during a midwinter sudden stratospheric warming. It's just the vortex doesn't recover afterwards. Um, like sudden stratospheric warmings, we have found that final warmings can be classified by their wave geometry and wave three has a more significant contribution in some cases. Uh, wave geometry is linked to these anomalous patterns of total column ozone in both hemispheres and differences in tropospheric circulation over particularly North America. And whether that's just a um, sampling feature or whether it's from the drivers of the wave geometry in the first place uh, remains open to question. Um, in the Northern early final warmings provide a significant source of near surface temperature predictive skill at weeks three, four in spring. It's possible that in general, all final warmings, if you are basing it around the final warming date, might give some increase in predictive surface skill, which we think is important since it's a tough season to make surface predictions at those long of leads. Um, and finally, in the Southern Hemisphere, the timing of the final warming has a much stronger effect than wave geometry on the tropospheric circulation with the opposing response for early versus late final warmings. And with that, I believe I'm done. So I'm ready to take any questions you may have. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Um, so we're going to switch over to Slido and the questions will take a little bit to um, trickle in. So um, I'll ask a quick question to fill the void while we wait for people to type things up. Um, so that point about the, the early warmings having a greater impact on um, predictability. So that sort of jives with them behaving more like a sudden sort of warming in midwinter. But is the skill increase greatest at weeks three to four or is there actually like a like, do you get as much skill increase at week, say, one to two as you do at three to four? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, we did not really look at that in that study because um, the problem with weeks one through two is that it's driven a bit by the initial condition. And so we wanted to see if we were looking past that lead time, um, is there still any skill related to this stratospheric event? And what we found is that there is. So it would be interesting to look, I'd be interested in looking at longer leads actually. So more weeks five, six and seeing what the difference is there. But some of our forecasts didn't go out that far. So um, it would be really cool to understand that better. Okay, uh, we've got a Slido question. So I can read these off if you want. Um, this is from Joan Alexander. I wonder what measure you use to say ECMWF is a good representation of the stratosphere when they have a sponge layer above 10 hectopascals is only the lower stratosphere rele relevant in the upper stratosphere unimportant. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know if we really know for sure. Um, I, you know, it is true that we sort of classified in our study, um, we looked at high top versus low top S2S forecast models. And to do that, we, you know, all we did is say the high top models, I think I'm trying to think of the level we, they had to have um, above maybe 0.1 hectopascals or something, a model lid of that. Um, we didn't look at where the sponge layer happened. So um, yeah, so we kind of classified by that. And it was true that 
uh, there was higher predictability often in the models with higher top um, for, for predictability of the stratosphere itself. Um, it didn't always mean that those same models had the best predictability at the surface. Um, so I guess it's a little bit hard to say, but um, I would definitely not say the upper stratosphere is unimportant. Uh, <laughs> I think increasingly that it's been shown that there are processes up there that can certainly have an influence, especially when we're looking at predictability. So, All right, and one more, uh, this is from Chad Merrill. It appears on the slide that shows a historical catalog of early versus late warming events in the Northern Hemisphere, that there's been a shift towards more late warming events after 1990. Any comments on the trends of the final warming events in the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, um, that's interesting. I guess I could show that slide maybe if that would help. Um, there is a little bit of a change, but we didn't, um, is it okay if I take over the screen share for a minute? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you're seeing this sort of um, trend sort of between 1980 and 2010. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about that too much, so I don't know if I have much to say, except that um, there, well, if it was just between 1990 and 2010, um, the, you know, the period between the 1990s and 2000s was pretty quiescent in the stratosphere in midwinter, so it was colder and there were fewer sun warmings. And then there were a lot more sun warmings um, that happened in the 2000s. And so I could see that that could kind of contribute to uh, what appears to be a trend um, between those decades. Um, again, with more sun warmings, uh, you would expect later, um, later final warmings to happen. And so maybe that's what is being shown there. Um, but I think overall, if you look at the full record, there's very little trend. Let me stop. Uh, oh yeah, okay, great. We can wait another minute. Um, if anyone's got another question they'd like to ask, don't be afraid to type it into Slido um, just below the webcast. Maybe a 30 second warning. <laughs> <laughs> Zach is saving the day. Um, Amy, thanks for the great talk. I know for some quantities, there is a seasonal cycle and forecast skill. Is it possible that there could be some sort of similar effect here when compositing early versus late final warmings, i.e. sampling more March versus May? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Zach. I think it's possible. We did try to eliminate that effect by um, comparing to these control forecasts so that um, basically what we're comparing to has the exact same seasonality dates at the same time as, as our final warming forecasts. And so um, that should hopefully at least minimize that effect. But it was a, you know, it's a concern that, yeah, when you do that, you're picking out um, really the seasonal cycle instead of the forecast skill. But hopefully compared to the forecast that are the same dates, just random time, random years um, that didn't have the final warming that year at that time, we're el el eliminating that possibility, so. Yeah. 
Okay, um, another question from Chad Merrill. Is there a strong correlation between an easterly QBO and a midwinter warming in the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, so um, there is some correspondence between an easterly QBO and uh, sudden stratospheric warming, but um, on the whole, you still can have sudden warmings happen during westerly QBOs and same with El Nino and La Nina. Um, you know, there is some statistical shift perhaps of the PDF, but um, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation at, by any means. So it can be pretty noisy trying to figure out um, those relationships. No Thanks, question, <laughs> just thanking Amy for the great talk. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, well, I will give everyone another maybe 15, 20 seconds um, if you have any other lingering questions. Okay, going once, going twice. Um, that was a great set of questions, everyone. Thank yes. you very much for, for tuning in and for asking um, questions at the end. Um, thank you again, Amy, for helping us learn all about um, final warmings and their surface impacts. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. We will yeah. see you at our next seminar. Thank you very much.